Welcome into the program, everybody. This is Breaking the Huddle. I am Joel Klatt. This show is brought to you by Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. Lots to get into today. Normally, I do a top 10, my new top 10, every single week right here on the top of the show. But let's face it, there is a story that has gripped college football and has become the biggest story in college football uh, so far. And that is the story of the alleged sign stealing at Michigan. And there's been a lot of new reporting. And so when you look at what's gone on, or at least what has been alleged to go, go on, there has been an assistant coach and analyst, Connor Stallions, who has been suspended. Um, and there is now some evidence, or at least allegedly some evidence, that he did buy tickets at 30 different games at 11 different locations in the Big Ten. Now, remember, Advanced scouting of any kind in college football is illegal. That rule was put back uh, in 1994. So if this took place, then it is going to be against the rules and they will be punished. I don't know the timetable of that. I can't, uh, I can't figure out the timetable. Normally, these type of investigations from the NCAA take some time. And it really boils down to a few questions for me. Who knew that this was going on and when? Who funded it and what did they collect with those tickets? And that's what the investigation is gonna have to figure out here over the next few weeks. Now, it does leave us with a bigger question. And that bigger question is, where do we go from here? How do we prevent this in the future? Because let's face it, there is a scenario that you can see where there is an environment that is created where you can potentially gain an advantage, and that is the fact that there's no audio in the helmet in college football. So a coach can't communicate to a player like they do in the NFL, one side on each side of the ball, like a linebacker on defense or a quarterback on offense. It makes you wonder, like, why? This, this was brought into the NFL in the mid-'90s. We're sitting here over 20 years later, and we don't have it in college football. Why? Why? In particular, when I will tell you, many coaches believe that sign stealing is a problem and that this would solve that. So why isn't it in college football? Well, there's four reasons, four reasons why we don't have audio in the helmets in college football. The number one reason is not a great one, but it's cost. Now you might be thinking to yourself like, aren't these programs flush with money and paying their head coaches four, six, eight, ten million dollars? The answer is yes. The problem is, is that we govern college football with a huge blanket. And it's not just the programs that are paying their coaches four, six, eight, ten million dollars. It's also Colorado School of Mines. And it's also South Alabama. And those programs don't have the type of budget where they can enter into an agreement for comms on both sidelines and really afford it and make it feasible. So part of the problem is that we govern in college football as if we're a parent parenting our infant and our 18-year-old the exact same way. How crazy would it be to give your 18-year-old as a parent a bottle with formula in it? Well, that's what we do in college football because we govern every single program the same, whether you've got a budget of $127 million or a budget, budget of $800,000. It's wild. The second reason why we don't have audio in helmets right now is we've got an issue with the helmets themselves. Remember, it's not one entity in the NFL and it's not just one helmet manufacturer that we have in college football. It's many and there's no association to collectively bargain with. So there's some question about liability. When you start to have a third market product brought into these helmets from several different manufacturers, people start to get a little bit nervous about the liability of the alterations made to these helmets. Who's liable? Are the warranties still good with all these different manufacturers? That's certainly a concern that people have brought up. The third reason is one that you might not have thought of, and that's the coaches themselves. Now, while every coach will tell you that sign stealing is a problem and that it's rampant within college football, I'm here to tell you that we could have had audio years ago if it wasn't for the coaches themselves. And the reason is, is because there are so many coaches that are gaining advantage by sign stealing. So they don't want audio in the helmet. They will say to each other, yes, we should do this, absolutely. Why aren't we doing this? And yet behind closed doors, they'll tell their athletic director in the shadows, Absolutely not. Don't change it. Make up an excuse about liability or cost or some other reason because we steal signs. 
That's happening in college football. I know it, and many people do as well. It leads to my last point. Why is this not fixed? Fragmentation. We've got way too many entities in college football looking out for the best interests of themselves and not for the sport. Remember, we don't have an overarching governing body, so we've got the Big Ten and the SEC and the Pac-12 and the ACC and the Big 12 and each program all looking out for their own best interest because that's what they're incentivized to do. The fact that we don't have a singular leader trying to push the sport forward means that we're going to be reactionary. We're going to have to react to a story like this from Michigan. We're going to have to react to no guardrails in NIL or non-conference scheduling or transfer portal or postseason. We react, react, react in college football because nobody is in a position to have the foresight to be on the front end of these problems. We need an overarching governing body in this sport in order to move forward and modernize the sport of college football. All right. Let's move to some more fun things to talk about, which is the games themselves, and namely the games that I called last weekend, Penn State, Ohio State, which was a phenomenal game, and the out pitch, Marvin Harrison Jr. I'm gonna tell you how the Buckeyes used him and how he was so effective coming up next. All right, welcome back to the program. Uh, like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about Marvin Harrison Jr. And let's get into it by first looking at Heisman Trophy odds. Now, they have shifted over the last couple of weeks, and J.J. McCarthy is up at top, and rightly so, by the way. I think J.J. is in the right spot up there at the top. Penix after the struggles against Arizona State, but then all the way down, Marvin Harrison Jr. By the way, that's unbelievable value. If you really look at the, the Heisman Trophy race, you've got to have stages and a path. The path and the stages are there for Marvin Harrison. I think the most likely scenario of the Heisman Trophy race would be Harrison and McCarthy facing off against each other with the trophy on the line in that Michigan-Ohio State game. I really do. One of the reasons I feel strongly about that is that Ohio State is going to continue to lean into Marvin Harrison Jr. And the reason is, is because he is an out pitch. All right, like Mariano Rivera, we're watching postseason baseball, right? World Series here. R Rivera's throwing the cutter. <laughs> you know it's coming. He knows he's throwing it, and yet he's still going to throw the cutter because he's going to go with his best. Well, that's exactly what Ohio State did last week against Penn State. They went with their best. Without Emeka Abuka on the field or Travion Henderson, they threw their out pitch, which was 16 targets to number 18, Marvin Harrison Jr. But they had to do that in many creative different ways because you can't just line them up and just say, okay, we're going to throw it to you the same way 16 different times. I want to take you into the game plan and, and really show you the, the – ingenuity from Ryan Day and the creative play calling and the ways that they tried to get Marvin Harrison Jr. in advantageous spots on the field to impact the game. Let's go back to last week against Penn State. This is, by the way, the first play of the game. So what do you do? You have Harrison Jr. on his own. He's a single receiver. All four players are on the other side, the running back tight end and both wide receivers. So you invite man coverage, and here comes the man coverage. Now you got the motion with the tight end, and the safety's going to come down. Here's the route structure. Tight end Stover's just going to run a little hitch. Marvin Harrison's going to run a corner, and you've got a concept up top. Now, you would think, like, boy, that's a lot of space to operate up top. But the problem is, is like, I want to throw it to Marvin Harrison Jr. He's single cover. So look at this, the quarterback Kyle McCord, he's not throwing it anywhere else than Marvin Harrison because he's in a one-on-one, -on -one. and in a one-on-one, -on -one, he knows he can win. It's the first play of the game, 18 is getting the ball, they get him single covered, bam, first down. That's the way to start, so that's set the tone for the rest of the game. Now we take a look at what's going on in the rest of the game. They come back out later with the exact same formation. Back tight end, two wide receivers, Harrison Jr. in what I call a nasty split or a short split singled up on one side and Penn State's running the exact same defense. And this is what I love about what the Buckeyes do here. They're gonna use the exact same motion and action that they did on that first play of the game right here. Except the difference is rather than running this corner route with Harrison Jr., they're gonna run him the opposite direction. So now they're playing on a tendency. These Penn State players remember seeing this motion. They remember this is called building and sequencing off of movement early in the game. And then you use the same movement to get a guy open. So here he comes dragging across the field. 
And Abdul Carter, the, the linebacker, who's kind of in a banjo or a two-way go there with Kalen King, they're trying to double cover Marvin Harrison, and yet he doesn't have his eyes on the receiver. He has his eyes on the quarterback, and what is Harrison? Wide open. So you get him the ball, he runs for a big gain. That's another way that you impact the game. You use those formations, you build on them with sequence. All right, let's take a look at a different example here. This was early on the first drive. Okay, you're gonna put him off the ball in a short set. Now, how do you get him the ball? Well, this is designed for Harrison, okay? No one else is getting the ball right here. So you're gonna invite the tight end to take the linebacker out of the formation. Then there's gonna be a run fake, and this is just a little boot screen. So the quarterback's gonna boot out to the left side. The linebackers have to fill because of the run threat right there. They step up into their gaps, and then Harrison just runs past the defensive end, and he's wide open for a screen. And you can see these players on the outside, the wide receivers, Fleming and Cade Stover, they're just immediately blocking. So this is essentially a play-action screen pass. Harrison, he's got a bad angle from the safety. He sees that, and he just takes it outside first down. That's not going anywhere other than Marvin Harrison, and they use that motion in order to get him open, and that was really good. Here's another example. Singled up, but way outside. Look at that, 16-yard split out wide, which what, the, what does that do? It forces this safety to declare, am I going to be a double cover safety, or am I going to come down into the box on third and 10 and be aware of, am I blitzing? Do I have run coverage responsibilities? He has to declare. What's he doing? Blitzing. So now it's single coverage with loads of space for Marvin Harrison Jr. to operate. That ball's never going anywhere other than Marvin Harrison Jr. right there, and it's tight coverage. In fact, Kalen King basically tackles him. They get the flag, still complete it anyway. So they put him out there and they force Penn State to declare, what are you doing on defense against number 18? Singled up, he's getting the ball. I love that from Ryan Day. Let's take a look at another example. Okay, let's talk about the pre-snap formation and movement. Okay, first of all, you've got a tight end, two tight ends on the field, and you've got a tight set. You're inviting an umbrella zone coverage because this is a run formation or a play action formation. So you call a safer defense. It's tough to play man coverage to this. Harrison's at the point of that bunch set but then you shift out of it. So you invite the zone coverage, now you shift out of it, and now you're in a separate formation. So now the linebacker is actually lined up over Harrison Jr. And here's what you can do is that you can take a shot deep. So what they're gonna do is immediately read the safety. What you've got down below is the wide receiver Fleming. He's gonna run straight down the field. If the safety doesn't go with him, he's gonna get the ball, but the safety has to respect the deep threat. Instead of coming down to cover or double Marvin Harrison, he's gotta go with that post, that deep threat that's running right down basically the seam. At this point, the linebacker who's in zone coverage is in no man's land. He's got nowhere to go. He can either take the back, which is really what his responsibility is, or he's gotta stay in kind of a man zone type of, of scheme and stay with Harrison, who's now running a wheel route. No man's land, nobody there. Great scheme, and it starts with the pre-snap shift. You invite zone coverage, expand the formation out, get a linebacker in a situation where he's gonna be uncomfortable. You put a run fake there, a back in his face, and then you run a wheel right behind him. That's brilliant stuff from Ohio State. That's a big way that they got him the ball. All right. Similarly, they're gonna use a shift on this third down late in the game. So now you've got a wide set, it's third down, and then you tighten it down. What do you do? You invite man coverage to start and then tighten it down. So now you've got the man coverage and you can run a man beater. What you're gonna do is you're gonna bring a couple of receivers from that tight side over and try to screen the man defender off of Harrison. This ball is designed for Marvin Harrison. It's third down, it's late in the game, you gotta get him the ball. So what Cade Stover does here is brilliant. What Cade Stover does, he doesn't run into this linebacker who's trying to look up Marvin Harrison. He's gonna run his defender into the linebacker. So watch as he runs just right in front of the linebacker right there. The two defenders collide, and now Harrison has a free run to the opposite side of the field. At that point, you've got to worry about the backside safety. Is he crashing down? Well, Ohio State has got that covered because they're going to run a stop route right in front of that face of that safety. And the corner on the other side, he's going to get expanded out by the route that's going out towards the outside. Look at all the room for Marvin Harrison Jr. 
So again, it starts with the pre-snap formation. You invite man coverage, then you tighten down the set, you get the man coverage to run your man concept, and then he's wide open through great execution from those routes on the left side. I tell you, watching that film, it's exciting. If you love football, you love what they were able to do. They were never not going to throw the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. They were going to throw their out pitch. And Ohio State did it 16 times in that game. He could have had even more catches if McCord wouldn't have been off a few times in that second quarter. I love, I love what they did in that game. That's what makes them so tough to beat. This is why Ryan Day is one of the best offensive coaches and play callers in college football. Really fun stuff there from Ohio State and their win over Penn State. When we come back, I want to take another look back at what I thought was probably the best game of the day. USC losing at home to Utah. What happened in that game? How did Utah move the ball? Let's take a look at some creativity and toughness when we come back from the Utah Utes. What's up, everybody? Let's get back into it. Let's go into the film for USC and Utah. What happened in that game? Now, that was a thrilling game. That was one of the great games of the college football season. But what actually happened? Well, I think it was actually Utah's offense that took ad advantage of some creativity and some tendencies from the USC defense in order to find success. Let's take a look at the film, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Okay, this is on the opening series. So you know that this is something that they found on Tuesday, they found on film. You got two tight ends in the game, two wide receivers, and, and a back. So you're inviting man coverage right here, and they get man coverage. They like this set. Okay, so this is a tendency. But what they see on film is that this back is getting basically double covered. If he goes inside, the middle linebacker's got him. If he goes outside, the defensive end's got him. Well, that's a mismatch with a defensive end. So what does Utah do? Rather than just running a little out route or some little swing route with the back, they run a wheel right past the defensive end, this outside linebacker. So that's the read. He's, wa he's waiting for the, is the safety going to fall back? Nope. Now I've got the one-on-one. -on -one. That's a clear mismatch and a great job by Utah's offensive coaching staff of during the week locating an area where they can attack early in this game. Love that from them. Now, let's take a look at some more creativity. I know it's just like a wildcat. Bryson Barnes, the quarterback. He goes out and lines up at a wide receiver. Now it's Sione Vake who's lined up at quarterback. And look, USC doesn't adjust. This is just mind-blowing. They're sitting out there as if Sione Vake is going to run this play as Bryson Barnes, as a quarterback. So none of these guys, including the safety, dips down into the box. What does that do? It leaves deficiency on the short side of the field. There's only three defenders in the run box on that short side to the split side. So what does Utah do? Overloads that side with extra gaps, extra hats, if you will. It's a power play with the quote unquote quarterback, who in this case is the running back, Sione Sion Vaki. And what do they do? They run for a first down. They overwhelm that side, and then you see some of that trademark poor tackling from USC. That is just a really poor job by USC from an adjustment standpoint, and a good job from USC of taking advantage of something that they see on film right there. Let's take a look now later uh, uh, in this game. It's an empty formation, so you got everybody spread out, okay? And remember, at this point, you're not a great passing team if you're Utah, and yet USC is defending this as if they're playing against Tom Brady. There's only two defensive tackles in the run box. The safety who's following the motion never inserts himself into the run box. So you've got four offensive linemen to basically block three. The two down linemen and maybe that linebacker that scoots in off of the motion. At that point, it's a walk-in touchdown, folks. You can seal off the backside end, and the motion defender, the safety, never inserts himself into the run box. Clear mistake. There's nobody there. There is nobody there. Great job by Utah's staff of identifying that near the goal line and then calling that play, and then they execute it perfectly. But a clear misalignment, missed assignment from USC on that touchdown. Now we go late in the game, and this is about situational awareness. Fourth quarter, 16 seconds left, 16. All you've got to do is prevent them from kicking what would be a chip shot field goal. 
And so in this case, you've got to play zone coverage, and they don't. They play man coverage, and nobody is spying the quarterback, not even this linebacker who gets caught up in man coverage. And then as Barnes leaves the pocket, first of all, the rush doesn't stay in their lanes. They leave the pocket. Look at all the defenders running with wide receivers as Barnes just runs down the field. Nobody spying them. Man coverage with 16 seconds left is crazy. It's crazy, and Utah was able to take advantage. you got to credit Brayson Barnes for what he was able to do on that last play. He located the coverage, he saw an opening, and he took it. But you see the mistakes in alignment and assignment from USC, which is plaguing this defense week after week. All right, when we come back, we got a little clap back to finish things off right here on Breaking the Huddle. All right, let's finish things off with a little clap back. Let's get out to it. Uh, just a, a couple of minutes here remaining in the program. Dave writes in on social media, Penn State ahead of Bama is a choice. I did have Penn State ahead of Bama in my top 10. It is a choice, and it's my choice. And the reason is, is that Penn State didn't lose at home to a team that also has lost. Penn State lost on the road to Ohio State in a top 10 matchup. And by the way, it's still a really good team. So it is a choice, and it's my choice. Thank you very much, Dave. Next, next up. Matt says, who does Ohio State have to beat to be number one? Michigan is great, but who have they beat that's noteworthy? Let's just take a look at the first part of that. Who does Ohio State have to beat to be number one? Michigan, Matt. Michigan. They have to beat Michigan. They haven't done that for two years. Michigan is the back-to-back -back Big Ten champion. Michigan is better this year than they have been even over the last couple of years. Who does Ohio State have to beat? Michigan. So if they win on Thanksgiving weekend, guess what, Matt? You and your little ears and funny picture that you got there, then Ohio State will be number one. Until then, they're going to be number two. So good luck with everything. Hey, uh, I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank Dr. Pepper for bringing us this program. It is the one fans deserve. Remember this week, a little bit of a change up. Gus, Ginny, and I will be on at 3.30 Eastern. We're at Utah, Oregon, and Utah in that matchup. And Jason, Brock, and Allison will bring you big noon Saturday. That one's at Kansas as Oklahoma goes on the road to take on the Jayhawks. It's going to be a great week into college football, folks, and we are getting down to it. Next week, we get playoff rankings. We're going to talk a lot about that next week right here on Breaking the Huddle.